I'd like to begin this lecture by acknowledging the ancestral and traditional territories of the Monacan Nation, who are the original owners and custodians of the land we occupy at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. What is culture? Anthropologists define culture as human behaviors and human organization. This is what frames our inquiry in this lecture, the notion of invisibility. One of the main things we have to look at is colonization. Colonizing cultures engage in cultural predation. That is what colonization is about. Essentially, colonization is where one culture is designed to go to other places, clear a space, and take that space from other cultures. Cultures become quite different than what is traditional because cultures always change and adapt to circumstances. That's what cultures do. So indigenous cultures in some communities are cultures of response. Responses to trauma, to dominance, to the alienation that takes place, and they respond to the poverty that results. Because essentially the argument anthropologists make, if there is social inequities, then there is social dominance. And the difference between the public discourse and the private discourse is where you see the degree of dominance and the features of cultural adaptation. So the way that people represent themselves to a wider audience, or even a tourist economy, compared to the artifacts at home, is known as the culture of response. Then there's the cultural impact of the mainstream. Passive design based on assumptions of a visual language. So for example, in the Americas, grouping all indigenous design into a homogenized pan-Indian motif. This conceals and suppresses the cultural identity, not just of the tribe, but of the whole. To represent a person or group is to inscribe identity onto them, whether it's in writing, verbally, or visually, in one of any number of available mass mediums. Indigenous peoples have long been objectified in representations in the media without any say in how others depict them. No right to view, approve, edit, or contest these images. These are from a popular children's book, Mary Poppins. Here's a closer look at the image depicting Native Americans. Other mediums include advertising, especially in the category of branding and package design, academic texts and travelogues, entertainment, and sports. Sports is a big one. Representations like this, which are changing. When they're repeated, they create a narrative which becomes our understanding of the way things are. Representations construct our reality. So what does it mean to be a culture maker? Well, a lot of what design can do and is called to do is cultural development. Design is synonymous with culture. There isn't a culture that doesn't have design and design is something that all cultures have. What are the cultural pathways? If you want evidence about how to proceed and what the cultural pathways are, the last people you ask are the majority population, the socio-political and economical drivers, because they're doing the inequity. That's basic good research methods. The way you look at the problem can't be driven by mainstream norms. When we look at design and indigenous knowledge, which is a living knowledge, the challenge is for indigenous groups to look at the knowing they have about themselves and about colonization. One of the roles of design is an intermediary. Design theorists call design an enabling mindset. So it's not exactly a solving mindset. It's a mindset that looks at the whole and says what sort of meanings can arise from this. Not what sort of products or what sort of processes, but what sort of meanings arise from this that might be beneficial to it? 
This is a very indigenous process compared to the Western mind that says what kind of meanings arise from this to get a better publication, a better graphic, uh, or a better poster, or a better object. Let's look at some indigenous designers. Angel Decora was a prominent native female designer from the Thunderbird clan, a part of the Winnebago culture. This is her portrait accompanying her essay, Native Indian Art. In Proceedings of the First Conference of the Society of American Indians in 1911. She's wearing a buckskin dress in Great Plains style and not of her own Winnebago culture. In 1907, Decora authored a book titled The Indian's Book. This is the cover design. In it, she advocated for the intrinsic value and legitimacy of Native arts in speaking to the broader society. Here you see an opening spread. On the left is a design and letter forms inspired from the visual language of the Hopi tribe, one of the many Native American cultures in the southwestern United States. On the right, Decora shows art from the Kwaki Oodle Indians, original people of the Pacific Northwest Coast. They live in British Columbia and Canada. Notice the difference in visual approach, such as the line and subject matter like whales, different than the Hopi tribe. Nibin Southall, a graphic designer and a member of the Chippewa of Rama First Nation, created the Native Graphic Design Project. In addition to published print articles, she curates an online database as a way to increase the visibility of North American indigenous graphic designers. One design firm, Southall Highlights, is Digital Navajo, an indigenous creative agency located in Albuquerque and Seattle. They teamed up with the University of North Carolina at Pembroke to focus on branding for their Native American student department. The resulting work consisted of indigenous design pulling from the Southeast Woodlands region. This is a petroglyph from Hiwassee Rock, Clay County, North Carolina, dating anywhere between 1000 to 1600 CDE. You can see how clear research led to a contemporary and specific aesthetic. In 2014, Digital Navajo rebranded the Haida Corporation in Heidelberg, Alaska to craft a brand that speaks to a newer generation of their community. Here's an example of authentic Haida art, Raven and Moon, Haida Weeping Woman, Bear and Frogs. The Haida are original people of the Pacific Northwest Coast. Their homelands are the islands near the coast of southeastern Alaska and northwest British Columbia. This is an identity for our Native American business network based in Portland, Oregon. Here you see a basket pattern as precedence for the design. This basket is from the Confederate tribes of Silitz Indians of Oregon, and it's an example of the tribe's authentic visual language. Beautiful geometric forms inspire digital graphics for a 21st century company. A Lakota graphic designer, Sadie Redwing, believes in the visual sovereignty of the unique tribal imagery. She designs specifically for Lakota. This is a design for Indigenous Peoples Day 2016. This is a poster workshop she conducted at Standing Rock to protest the Dakota Access Pipeline. That's that 1,172-mile-long 1 oil pipeline project that was supposed to cross into sacred tribal lands and threaten to contaminate the local water supply. That has since been disbanded. This piece is titled Lakota plus Dakota Visual Essay. All Lakota grammar originates in the line, the triangle, and the square. This line and plane based visual vocabulary evolved as Lakotas used porcupine quills to create the traditional shapes. Because quills can't form rounded shapes like circles, you won't see those in the design. And note, those shapes that appear to be rounded are actually created with triangular shapes. This is Sadie Redwing's interactive project from her graduate thesis work at NC State learning the traditional Lakota visual language through shape play.
It serves as a guide for how Native American designers can research their own traditional visual languages and apply those to their contemporary practice. South Hall also listed contemporary Native designers Rico Worrell, a Tlingit Athabascan designer and founder of Trickster Company, who, along with his sister Crystal, designs products from basketballs to apparel featuring Northwest Coast art. Worrell observes Tlingit property law and does not create designs utilizing specific clan crests. The name of their company, Trickster, comes from the traditional human and animal creation stories of the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest Coast. Raven stories exist in nearly all of the First Nations throughout the region, but are most prominent in the tales of the Tlingit and Talton people. The ravens, always a magical creature able to take the form of human, animal, and even inanimate objects. Raven is a keeper of secrets and a trickster hence the name of the company. The aesthetic you see in their work is called formline. Formline is a composition of lines whose widths vary to create form. The overall collection of these compose an image or a design. Formline is an art that dates back more than 2,000 years. The formline designs may represent stories of the raven, the trickster, historic events, clan crests, or other concepts. This is a home in the Yukon Territory in Northwest Canada that has these beautiful formline compositions all over its structure. The Trickster Company's focus is on Northwest Coast art. The designers explore themes and issues in Native culture, and they strive to represent a prestigious lineage of art in fresh, new, and energetic ways as a celebration of a contemporary Northwest Coast culture. Their aim is to produce products which act as cultural objects to represent a modern Indigenous people through their heritage. It's also to create products that non-Native people can wear and use and appreciate without appropriating via cultural exchange. By doing this, they hope to represent modern Indigenous lifestyle to a broader audience. Eagle and Raven skateboards were the original products for the company. These designs are from the traditional colors that Tlingit people originally harvested from natural dyes, and then they use bold and alternative colors as well. The longboard on the right is designed by one of the in-house designers, Ronnie Fairbanks, who is Tlingit, Chimshian, and Chippewa. As well as being an in-house designer, he's also a teacher. He teaches in Southeast Alaska, and he teaches Northwest Coast Formline Art in public schools. This is a product they created called Cards for Decolonization. It's a satire and humor-based game created by and for Native people. As it states on the back of the package design, Cards for Decolonization attempts to embrace the modern Native culture and allows us to learn and laugh at the same time. Gary Abelarosa says of the game, Through this short and profound experience, I realized how putting these stereotypes on the table can help with the decolonization of the individuals who would be playing the game. It also drives the conversation to a deeper level, shifts the paradigms, and awakes consciousness. It leads to storytelling of one's culture, which can be liberating, transformative, and set the trajectory for culture healing and revitalization. And it is so hilariously wrong.